Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and today I'm going to be doing my December wrap up and talking about all the books that I read in the month of December. So I am now back, I have been off booktube for like 10 days over Christmas but now we're back for the new year with a lot of videos. I really love the like new year bit of booktube with favourite books of the year and goals for the next year and all of those kind of videos so there will be plenty of them coming up in the month of January um, and a Christmas book haul as well but I thought I would start off with my December wrap up and tell you about what I read in December. So in December I read 17 books, um, I had a really good reading month partly because I was off work for um, the last like 10 days of December which was very nice. Um, so in December I read three unpublished books for work, if you don't know I work in a publishing house so I do read books that I can't talk about on this channel yet. Um, but as well as those three books I also read 14 books that I can tell you about so let's get straight into them. Throughout 2019 my project was to read a Anthony Trollope book every month um, and I successfully did that throughout the year except for in July where I did not read an Anthony Trollope book so therefore in December I read two to make up for it. The first Trollope book I read in December was The Claverings and I'm very glad that I decided to read The Claverings on a whim because it was fantastic. It was one of my Trollope highlights of the year. Um, so The Claverings tells the story of a family called the Claverings, specifically focusing on a young man called Harry Clavering, um, who in true Trollope style falls in love with one woman who is probably quite suitable for him, but then there is another woman who he used to be in love with, who he still sort of harbours feelings for, um, and who might not be the right choice but also is a really sympathetic character in her own right and therefore you're kind of rooting for two different women who both want Harry Clavering. It's very very compelling, really good fun, really entertaining, it's really well written. Harry Clavering is a fantastic character, he has those, that particular characteristic that Trollope is very very good at writing where he has a character who does things that they really shouldn't do and behaves in a stupid way but you also can really sympathise with because you understand that they know they're behaving stupidly. One of my favourite lines in the whole book which I think really sums up the personality of Harry Clavering as a character is he told himself that he was an ass but he still went on being an ass. But as well as this like main plot going on there is a few sort of subplots to do with various characters including one to do with um, Harry's sister and actually the subplot to do with Harry's sister it was wonderful and there were like some passages in that that were sort of incredibly moving that was fantastic as well I would super super recommend The Claverings definitely one of my Trollope highlights for the year and I would say as well that it's probably a very good place to start with Anthony Trollope because it's not too long the plot is not as complicated in other books. One thing I would say about The Claverings is I wouldn't read it too close to the Eustace Diamonds because the plot is slightly similar in some ways. Um, I preferred The Claverings to the Eustace Diamonds, I enjoyed it much more, but the particular setup and the main hero, um, there are some similarities. They do have quite similar plots. Anthony Trollope wrote 47 novels, he had to reuse plots sometimes. I, I kind of forgive him, I don't really mind. <laughs> don't read them back to back. The second Anthony Trollope book I read in December was Harry Heathcote of Gangoyle. Um, so this is a short Christmas novella by Anthony Trollope. So this tells the story of a young man called Harry Heathcote. It is actually set in Australia, quite unusually for Anthony Trollope. He lives with his wife and his sister-in-law and in his kind of obstinacy and independence and suspicion he has like annoyed all of his neighbours and it kind of follows him maybe realising that he should be a little bit more kindly disposed towards people so it was a really interesting setup um, and I did enjoy it, it just didn't it didn't feel like an Anthony Trollope novel for me I don't know why, possibly just because it was set in Australia but I think if I had read that book not knowing it was by Anthony Trollope I wouldn't have thought it was by Anthony Trollope because there was something about the writing style which just wasn't quite trollope -y. I just didn't feel the characterization was like as strong as it Trollope's usually is, um, so I enjoyed it. I think it's a, a good story, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this as a great Trollope to read unless you are a completionist and want to read all of Trollope like me, because there are better Trollopes out there. Another classic I read in December was A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. This is a reread for me. I don't know how many times I've read A Christmas Carol, but probably about ten. Um, I tend to reread it every year, or at least I think for the last few years I've reread it every year because I love it a lot, and also it's very short, so it's not like it takes a long time. Um, so I listened to an audiobook of this, which was just like three hours. So I listened to it all in one evening while 
while doing like Christmas wrapping and chores and stuff like that which was really lovely. I love A Christmas Carol a lot. I've made an individual book review of it before, possibly two, so I'll link both of them down below. You probably know the story but it follows a not very nice man called Scrooge who is visited by various spirits on Christmas Eve who try together to make him into a better person. There are many amazing things about A Christmas Carol. It's incredibly timeless, obviously it's incredibly timeless. Um, the fact that it has stood the test of time so well and is still like adapted and readapted and parodied and everything so much really shows I think how much it has stood the test of time. But not only is the story itself really heartwarming and beautiful but also I do think it is one of Dickens's best piece of writing. Like sentence by sentence the te like the technical impressiveness and the way Dickens writes in A Christmas Carol is amazing. Even just like I'm sorry, I have to. I, I, I can't help myself. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Mind. I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about the doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country is done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Like, only Dickens would be like, Marley was as dead as a doornail. Why a doornail? And then just like have a little tangent paragraph. Only Dickens. I love it. I love it so much. Um, I feel like A Christmas Carol is one of the best places to start with Dickens because it really showcases like the absurdity of his writing, the wonderful like magical oddness of the way he phrases things and the way he uses language. I love it so much and it's so beautiful and it makes me cry a lot and it's amazing and it makes me feel very, very Christmassy. So. Yes. Anyway, moving on from that. I also read this little collection of short stories, A Pair of Silk Stockings by Kate Chopin. Um, so this is a Penguin Little Black Classic, which I always enjoy. I'm really excited now to read more by Kate Chopin because this was fantastic. The stories in here were just amazing. Just really well-crafted, well-written, clever, moving, powerful short stories in a kind of like Catherine Mansfield esque way, like really really fantastic. This reminded me why I love short stories. I haven't read that many short stories this year and this really reminded me that I should read more because I do love them. But I think the story of an hour was my favourite, which was just an incredible story, like it was just so powerful and so interesting. Um, especially in terms of like the position of women at the kind of turn of the century in America. I just, yeah, this was fantastic. Really, really loved these a lot. Hello, Katie from the future here. I realised while I was editing this video that I'd forgotten to mention one of the books I read in December. I just completely forgot about it. Um, I just skipped it over in my list, so there we go. I will mention it now and then we'll go back to the past. Another book I read in December was The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. This is the fourth Poirot book. Me and Nick are currently working our way through all of Poirot one at a time um, because we both really like Agatha Christie and we thought it would be fun to work our way through them listening to them on audiobook. Um, mostly listening to the audiobooks narrated by Hugh Fraser which are really great and I would highly recommend. So in The Murder of Roger Ackroyd this is the first book in the Poirot series where it's not narrated by Hastings. We have a new narrator who is a doctor in a small town and we follow him um, and what happens when two deaths occur in the neighbourhood and Poirot, who is his next door neighbour, gets involved. It's a really fantastic mystery, really well done. I love Agatha Christie's writing always. I think she's very witty and smart. I think her characterization is wonderful and the way she like weaves mysteries and um, puts twists and turns along the way are really fantastic. So yeah, this is a really fantastic Poirot. I really, really enjoyed it and definitely looking forward to reading more Poirot in the future. Another short classic I read in December was The Little Prince by Anton de Saint-Exupéry. I really enjoyed this one. Um, it's a very sweet little story. It's a children's classic and one that I've never read before but have been meaning to read for ages. And the website bookishly very kindly sent me a free classic subscription box um, to put in my Christmas gift guide in which was this. Um, so I finally got round to reading it and I really enjoyed it. It tells the story of a small prince who comes from another planet and what happens when someone from our planet meets him and they talk about different planets in the sky. It's just very sweet and really lovely and it also has quite like fun illustrations throughout which are nice as well. In the same bookish box I also got this which is The Distance of the Moon by Italo Calvino which I read and really enjoyed. This is a collection of a few short stories and um, sort of 
I was going to say science fiction, but they're not quite science fiction. They're sort of a, a weird mix between magic realism and science fiction. I really enjoyed these. They're quite weird, but in quite an understandable and enjoyable way. So I haven't read any Italo Carvino before. I've heard about him a lot, but I've always put off reading him because I, I had in my head that he was going to be really inaccessible, like Borges. I don't know why I've always associated Borges and Italo Carvino. I think I must have just heard someone say that they like both of them, um, and that's as simple as that. And so I had in my head that it would be really tricky and hard to understand. But actually, um, this was really enjoyable and weird, but in a accessible way. So I'll definitely try and read more by him in the future. Moving on to contemporary literature, on Christmas Day itself I read The Festive Spirit by Kate Atkinson. Um, this is just a tiny little collection of short stories um, that all set around Christmas, which I really, really enjoyed. It was good fun to have something little to read on Christmas Day. I think my favourite ones were probably the first and last story. The middle story, which is the title story, is a bit magic realist, and I didn't like that as much because in general I prefer realist short stories. The, the first and last story especially, which were my favourites, um, a quite sort of subtle, quiet, everyday moments of realisation that your life is better than you think it is kind of stories, which I really enjoyed. So that was a good fun read. It also read Miss Marley by Vanessa Le Fay, so another Christmassy read. So this is a prequel to A Christmas Carol, um, which came out last year and I thought I would give a read. Um, so the bulk of it was written by Vanessa Le Fay, um, but she died um, towards the end of writing this. So the last few chapters were written by Rebecca Maskell. There were some things I really enjoyed about this. I think it's quite fun to have a prequel. It's a, it's quite a fun idea to write about Jacob Marley and the sister that he fictionally has in this book because in A Christmas Carol, like Scrooge is given a chance to be a better person, but why was Marley never given a chance to be a better person? And I like that this kind of explains that and kind of gives Marley a chance to be a better person that he doesn't take in the way Scrooge does. Um, that is quite cleverly done in here. I will say that I feel this is a bit underdeveloped and I think it is because Vanessa Le Fay died um, three quarters of the way through writing this um, and Rebecca Maskell stepped in and wrote the end. I really love the end but I think you can see that if the author hadn't died part of the way through writing this she probably would have gone back and developed certain bits more um, and I also think it means that there are certain editorial things that weren't changed it, out of respect to her which I understand but like for example, at one point early on in this book, um, Clara has her photograph taken. Really, really, really early photography barely existed when A Christmas Carol was published. And this is obviously set like a good 30 years before A Christmas Carol. Cameras did not exist, um, which was a historical actually that I found really annoying. So yeah, I did still really enjoy it. I would recommend it. It just wasn't completely perfect for me. I also read Exposure by Helen Dunmore in December, which I really, really loved. Um, I'm so excited now to read more by Helen Dunmore. In fact, I've just started reading another book by her already. So this is set in the 1960s um, and it follows this couple and their children and what happens when the father in this family who works for the civil service gets caught up in something out of his depth and everything kind of spirals and everything kind of completely collapses. But we focus not just on this man Simon but also his um, ex-lover and colleague Giles and also his wife Lily. There are so many things I loved about this book, this is definitely a favourite of this year. I think the characterisation in this was absolutely superb, the writing in this was amazing, the plot was so dramatic and so gripping, especially like the last third, I was just on the edge of my seat, it was so good and I just didn't know what was going to happen in a way that was so powerful because the first half of the book is quite like slow and quiet in many ways. Um, this sort of, this book is like a weird mix of like a domestic novel about a husband and wife and also a spy thriller um, and they come together in the most amazing incredible way which I just loved um, but also the characterization in this was just superb Simon, Lily, Giles and um, the children everyone else in this book was just so incredibly well-rounded so cleverly done um, in such a masterful way like I just absolutely loved it um, and I think Simon as a character and his relationships both with Giles and with Lily were so well explored and then Lily, who at the beginning half of the book is sort of a slightly background character, in the second half of the book was just so incredible and so well done. I loved it a lot. Would highly, highly recommend this and I can't wait to read more by Helen Dunmore in the future. Another fantastic novel I read this month was Sweet Bean Pace by Jurian Sukagawa. I really, really enjoyed this one. This one I also got on a book subscription box. Um, Asume Books very kindly sent me a review copy um, and I really really love this. So this tells the story of a man living in Tokyo working in a somewhere between a confectioner shop and a bakery. The way I understand it in my head is a bakery but I don't think that's 
what it is in Japan, if you see what I mean. Um, but he makes these like pancakes filled with sweet bean paste, um, but they're not that great. He doesn't love his job. He knows that the food is not that good, but he just kind of works there because he has to. And then one day this elderly woman turns up and says, I can help you, can I work here? I've been making sweet bean paste for 50 years. Um, he like helps her turn the shop around and his life around but also she is hiding something from him um, and then they also kind of befriend this schoolgirl who comes to the shop as well. I really really love this a lot. This was really beautiful and really moving and powerful um, and the way this looks at kind of Japanese history as well um, and certain elements of Japanese history I can't really explain what without spoiling it but that aspect of it I loved so much and I thought was so cleverly and, and wonderfully done but also the way this book writes about food and kind of character relationships through food. So Banana Yoshimoto is my favourite Japanese author and one of the things I love so much about her writing is the way she writes about food and emotion together and I feel like um, that's done very much here as well with a like a blending of food and emotion and characterization in a wonderful way. I really 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 love this book and would highly highly recommend it. Definitely a wonderful Japanese novel, um, one of my favourite Japanese fiction books I've read this year, and yeah, this is great, very good. But my favourite book of the month, and one of my favourite books of the year so far, is this. This is um, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow by Natasha Pulley. In my book haul before Christmas I talked a great length about how excited I was for this and I was rightly excited because it was amazing. So this is a sequel to The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. The Watchmaker of Filigree Street is one of my favourite novels of all time ever. It is amazing. This is now also one of my favourite novels of all time ever because it is also amazing. This um, follows on from where the watchmaker of filigree street leaves off but like five years in the future i want to explain more about what this book is about but i don't know how to do it without spoiling the watchmaker of filigree street and the watchmaker of filigree street is so good and the plot of it's so unexpected that i really don't want to do that so i can't quite explain the plot of this but we follow the characters from the watchmaker now in japan investigating something odd that is happening and various unusual occurrences and it's amazing and it's beautiful and like the first book there is clockwork there's like a little bit of magic not too much magic just the right amount of magic amazing characters like the most beautiful moving love story like such fantastic exploration of historical events an incredibly wonderful atmosphere that perfect blend of like historically accurate but also really quirky and fun with amazing characterization amazing character relationships like so believable so real combining like such clever writing and such wonderful character development with like such a dramatic exciting plot that was really amazing um, and i loved it a lot and it was fantastic and it made me very happy and i love it I forgot to say the publisher sent me a review copy for it. If you've read The Watchmaker at Filigree Street, please buy this when it comes out in March. It's so good. It's such a worthy sequel. I love The Watchmaker at Filigree Street so much and I didn't know how it could be as good, but it's so good and I love it and I love these characters so much. And if you haven't read The Watchmaker at Filigree Street, you have like two months to do that before this comes out, so on you go. Finally I have two other books to mention to you. Both of these were audiobooks I listened to in December and both of these are published by Bonnier Books UK. Bonnier Books UK is where I work and um, I am going to be working on these two authors going forward so I have not worked on them previously so I thought I would catch up um, and read these two books. So the first one was The Wayward Girls by Amanda Mason. This is a ghost story of sorts in the same way that many of Diane Setterfield's novels are ghost stories where they are both ghost stories and also not quite ghost stories. We follow a woman called Lucy both in the present day and also in the past in the summer of 1976 when her, her parents and her four siblings moved into this very strange house that seemed to be haunted and we follow the story in 1976 when the hauntings are ongoing and then we also follow the story in the present day where some paranormal investigators go to this old house um, where the family lived that summer to try and find out more about the haunting and whether or not it was real um, and slowly the past begins to unravel and the truth will out itself. It's so good. Well, it's really character driven, focused on a kind of dysfunctional, weird family with all of their problems. Like I said, if you love Diane Setfield, you will really enjoy this. And yeah, I'm excited to be working on Amanda Mason's books in the future. 
On a similar ghostly theme, I also read A House of Ghosts by W.C. Ryan. This is set during the First World War and we follow um, two people in particular, a man called Donovan who um, is a spy of sorts and a woman called Kate who is also a spy of sorts but to a slightly lesser degree than Donovan. And they are both sent um, sort of undercover to this big house party happening in this grand house on an island dislocated from everything in the middle of a storm where the plan is to host a seance um, for the couple who own this house to get try and get in touch with their sons who have died in the First World War. And then of course things start to go mysteriously wrong in a slightly Agatha Christie way and there is plenty of betrayal and drama and ghosts as well. Um, like The Way With Girls this is not like a horror ghost story and um, this is much more of a character driven, plot driven, um, mystery led ghost story um, with quite like Agatha Christie vibes in many ways. I found it really really good fun while there is lots of drama going on. There's also a good amount of like really witty dialogue and things like that which I really enjoyed as well. And again very excited to be working on WC Ryan's books in the future. And that is all I have to say for now. Um, a lot of books that I read in December so I'm sorry if this has been quite a long video but I had a really good reading month which was great. That is all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know what you read in the month of December. Especially let me know if you are excited for The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow because you should be because it's awesome. Um, and that is all I'm going to say for now. Thank you very much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.